Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents. Jesus is that ladder. He is our only safety net that will prevent us from dropping off into eternity unprepared. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Millennium of Prophecy video series. Abraham was called the father of the faithful. God had told Abraham and Sarah that through their descendants, all the nations of the world would be blessed. Finally, one of the great miracles of the Bible is Abraham, over 100 years of age, and Sarah, over 90, gave birth to a baby boy. God had promised that through this son, the Messiah would come. All the nations of the world would be blessed. God would become a man through the ancestors of Isaac. You can understand why Abraham was shocked one day when the Lord spoke to him in the wee hours of the morning. He said, Abraham, he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Bring him unto the mountains of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering unto me. Abraham had come to the place where he recognized the voice of God and without arguing, he didn't want to wake up Sarah and break this news to her. He woke up his son Isaac, he got a couple of servants, they got some wood, they got the tools for building a fire, and they began a three-day journey. At the end of three days, they could stand at the base of the mountains of Moriah, which were the hills of Judea. He left the servants, and he and Isaac started up the hill. They made a three-and-a-half-day journey. Don't miss that. The Bible tells us Christ, from his baptism to his cross, was three-and-a-half years. One of the things I'll tell you that is a key for prophecy is in prophecy, a day equals what? Who knows? A year. You know that. Most Bible scholars know that, that in prophecy, a day equals a year. And so they made the journey up the mountain. As they're going, Isaac said, Father, and Abraham said, Here I am, my son. He said, We have the wood, and we've got what it takes to build the fire, but the lamb is missing. Where is the lamb? And Abraham said in those immortal words, God will provide himself a lamb. The Lord provided himself a lamb. This was a historical talking about the plan of salvation. Here Isaac, the son, has the wood, the cross on his back as the two of them go up the mountain together. Some think that it was only the son who suffered on the cross. God the Father so loved the world he gave his son. Who suffered more at the crucifixion, the father or the son? Uh, they both suffered. It was jointly. When they got to the top of the mountain, Isaac was a strapping young man. Abraham couldn't wrestle him to the ground over 120 years of age probably at that time. He explained what God had required. Isaac was a willing sacrifice, just as Jesus said, Father, not my will, thy will be done. And just as Abraham was about to bring down the knife, an angel spoke out and said, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay your hand on the lad or do any harm to him. He said, For I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. It's very interesting the echoes that you hear from the Gospels in this story. And then the angel directed him to a ram that was caught by the horns in a thorn bush. A ram with a crown of thorns was sacrificed in place. So when Abraham said God will provide himself a sacrifice, God did provide a sacrifice. Literally that day, he provided a ram. But that was a historical. That was a prophecy that tells us someday God the Father would provide for himself a sacrifice. God the Son was provided for you and me. And that was to help us recognize in the New Testament who Jesus was when he came. He was the Messiah. What a touching story of the Father and the Son together making that sacrifice that you and I might be redeemed. Everybody needs to deal with this issue if we would understand the message of the gospel and the Bible. Whom did the animal that was sacrificed in Isaac's place represent? The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and he said, Behold the 
Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the Jewish nation. Takes away the sin of how much? Whole world. Jesus was to come through the Jewish nation and the Jews had the greatest honor of any race. They were to introduce the Messiah to the world, which is what happened at Pentecost, incidentally. All Jews were converted that day who then scattered throughout the then known world telling that the Messiah had come. God does not believe in exclusivism. He wants everyone to be saved. Revelation closes by saying, whosoever will, let him come and take the water of life freely. God loves all people. And he wants us all to be saved. And he's proven it in what he's done. Now, Jesus was called the Lamb of God. There's a reason for that. You can look all the way from the Garden of Eden. You remember when Abel brought a lamb. The sacrificial system was established way back in the beginning. Adam and Eve sinned, and they tried to cover their nakedness with what? Fig leaves. Fig leaves are a symbol in the Bible of self-righteousness. Do you remember when Jesus cursed the fig tree? It had leaves, but no fruit. Self-righteousness is what that means. God said, sorry, Adam, Eve, that will not work. The Bible says he gave them coats of skins. Something had to die back there in the Garden of Eden to cover their nakedness. It was at this time the Lord established the sacrificial system. That's why Abel brought his offering to the gates of the Garden of Eden, and he offered a lamb, and God accepted it. And every lamb, whether the ones that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob offered, or the ones that were offered by Moses in the temple, they all pointed forward to when God's Son, the Lamb of God, would come and take away the sin of the world. And you know, Jesus had to die to save this perishing world. Why was it necessary for Jesus to die? Isn't that drastic? Well, the Bible gives us the answer. It tells us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned, and all sin is enough for Jesus to die. If you were the only person in the world who sinned, he would have died just for you. But because he's God, and because his life and his blood and sacrifice was so potent, he was able to cover the sins of the whole world. What is the penalty for sin? It tells us for, and you've got the answer there, the wages of sin is death. Now, that sounds pretty drastic. The death penalty just for telling a little lie? You don't understand the true nature of sin. You know, it started very small in heaven with uh, Lucifer, and look at what the fruit of it is. You know, cancer starts as one cell. Sin is a deadly, contagious disease. Now, our Father, God, has been faced with a terrible dilemma. He desperately loves all of His creatures. And when this world rebelled, it would have been an easy thing for God to go, they messed up down there, let's just wipe them all out, we'll start fresh. But God is using this opportunity to show that He is desperate to save. And that's why the Lord has to do something drastic. It's so drastic that He has to pronounce the death penalty because sin will kill the whole universe if He doesn't deal with it that way. But the Lord activated another plan. What does it say? Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. You know, blood not only supplies food for every cell in your body, but blood cleanses. Your body is constantly being cleansed. As a matter of fact, in your blood, you've got an army of white blood cells that are constantly purifying your blood from a bombardment of germs and bacteria. The very fact that most of the time we're alive and well is because your blood is cleansing. Well, if your blood can do that, what can the blood of God's spotless Son do? The blood of Christ cleanses us. It tells us that Christ died for our sins. Now, the Bible tells us he died for our sins, and that means, of course, the sins of the whole world. Sometimes we forget to make it personal. People are so worried that they're beyond forgiveness. Friends, give God more credit, would you? Do you think you're a better sinner than he is a forgiver? And if he was able to die and cover the sins of the entire world, Think about how much sin is represented in your life, over the course of your life, in this room. Now, all the sin of all the world. If he can carry the weight of all the sin of all the world, can he take care of yours? Yes, he can. Amen. He is a better Savior than you are a sinner. Furthermore, it says, For Christ also hath suffered once for the sins, the just for the unjust. How is it that he could die for our sins? 
because we are unjust and he is just. Now, some people can't figure out how it's possible that this all works. How can the blood of Jesus wash us from sin? How can a just person forgive an unjust person? It would seem like that the unjust person had to pay for their own sins. I'll admit freely right now that there are some things I can't explain. I like the way that Billy Sunday, the great preacher, put it. He said, I don't understand how a black cow can eat green grass and make yellow butter and white milk. But I believe it. It just doesn't make sense, but it works. And I'm here to tell you today that it works. Why did God make such a fantastic sacrifice for you and me? The answer, you know this one, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know, love is demonstrated in giving. And not only says God love the world, there's a very important two-letter word in there. In English, it's two letters. It's the word so. It means so much. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. I mean, what are you going to give that's your greatest treasure, your house, your piano, your car? He gave his son. What must I do to benefit from Jesus' sacrificial death? Answer, Acts 16, verse 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. When Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he said in John 3, verse 14 and 15, just before you get to verse 16, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Some of you remember the story in the Old Testament where the children of Israel were bitten by these fiery, venomous, deadly serpents. And they cried out to Moses, what shall we do? And God instructed Moses to make a bronze or a brazen serpent, put it on a pole. Whoever looks and believes will be healed from the venom. Have you ever seen the symbol for the medical industry? That serpent on a pole, it's supposed to be a symbol for healing. Some say that represents Jesus. No, it doesn't. A snake on a stick represents a defeated snake. Looking at the serpent on a pole was a symbol that Jesus, by dying on the cross, by looking in faith to him, he killed the serpent. He took the venom away, the venom of sin that we've all been bitten with, so to speak. That's what this is telling us. How does that happen? You believe it. You know, it is impossible to please God without faith. If there's anything I could leave with you tonight, if I ran out of time, and there's one point that I needed to emphasize, it's very simply this, friends. Do not underestimate the power of faith. The Bible says God has dealt to all men a measure of faith. You have no idea of what can happen when you start believing in God. And incidentally, believing in God also means be live in God. Some people think all you've got to do to be saved is you say, yeah, I believe that there's a God, and I believe that there's a Jesus, and that means I'm saved. That's an insult. It's not that. It's much more than that. The Bible says in the book of James, even the devils believe and tremble. The devil believes there's a God. It's not believing he exists. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart there's no God. It's talking about believing in him enough, being willing to follow and submit to him. John 1, 12, I needed to give the second part of this answer. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. You know, the Bible tells us that we are adopted into the heavenly family. Once you accept the Lord, you've got new parents. My, my family thought I went off the deep end when I became a Christian. And I read a scripture in Psalms where King David says, When your father and your mother forsake you, the Lord will take you up. You're adopted into a new family, and he provides for you better than you provide for your children. How then am I forgiven? Let's understand the science of how this operates. Answer, repent therefore and be converted that your sins might be blotted out. There's a combination of repenting. Now, repentance doesn't just mean saying, sorry, God. Repentance, biblically, is a deep, heartfelt sorrow for sin, sorrow that we've hurt God, wanting to turn away from sin. The Bible says the Pharaoh of Egypt repented whenever there was a plague bothering him, and when the plague went away, he went back to his old bad behavior. That's not the repentance the Bible's talking about. The Bible tells how Peter repented, and he wept bitterly, and he was a changed man. That's the repentance. If on the way out the door, I'm racing for the elevator and 
I accidentally bump into you and brush your coat or something, I'm not going to say, I'm sorry, and fall down and grab your ankles and plead for mercy because I haven't hurt you that much. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the apology should always be in proportion to the injury. You got that? The apology should be in proportion to the injury. But if I'm racing to the elevator and I'm not looking the right way and I plow right into you like a linebacker and send you sprawling and give you a concussion, and say, excuse me, and then go on down the road, that's not appropriate either. We, we, by our sins, crucify Jesus. Repentance doesn't mean saying, sorry, Lord, I <laughs> didn't mean it. That's an insult. We should really understand how much we've hurt him and we've grieved him and we caused the death of God's beloved son. Now, to really appreciate forgiveness, you need a thorough repentance. And that gets to our next part of the question. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from some all unrighteousness. Some people have a very shallow Christian experience because they've had a very shallow work with God. You know what David did when he sinned? He got on his face. He did not eat for seven days. Now that's repentance. To give you an idea of how God views real repentance. And if we repent like that, we will then, David was then again filled with God's Spirit because he had a thorough repentance. God will fill you to the same degree you empty yourself of self. That's the promise. What is this wonderful conversion experience called? Answer, you must be born again. A new birth. Does a baby worry about growing? What does a baby do in order to grow? It receives what the parents provide. The cleansing, and we all need an occasional cleansing, and it receives the food and the water and the milk. You know, we receive the milk of God's Word as Christian babies and the bread of life. And a baby needs to just keep breathing. When they stop breathing, they call that crib death. They need to keep breathing. They need some affection. And as they receive the things the parents provide, babies don't worry about growing. They grow. Who enters the heart of the born-again Christian at conversion? Answer, even the spirit of truth which you know, for he dwells with you and he will be in you. Jesus said, I've got to go away. But I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and He will be in you, and He will be with you. Now, God's Spirit did not suddenly appear in the New Testament. It was the same Spirit of the Lord that came on Samson. And King David prayed, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And back in Genesis, the Spirit of God moved on the face of the water. God, in the beginning, said, Let us make man in our image. God consists of God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Spirit. You don't find the word Trinity in the Bible, but I believe in what you call the Godhead, three separate persons that make up God. In Hebrew, it says a man and woman get married, and they two become what? One flesh. It doesn't mean that Karen and I merge together into a two-headed monster. It means you're two separate people now, but you become one family unit. There is one God who consists of three persons. God the Father, Son, and Spirit. God the Spirit moves into your heart and He guides you. And friends, it's a wonderful thing. When Jesus lives in my heart through the Holy Spirit, what will I do? Philippians 2.13, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. The Lord will give you the ability to not only be a hearer of the Word, but a doer. Some people view the Christian religion as a list of rules. And there's a lot of requirements in the Bible. God does have standards, and I believe in that. But you need to understand the principle. God is love, and He wants us to be motivated by love. Some people try to work their way to heaven. They see God as a tyrant, and He's giving them a list, and you do these things, and we'll stay married. And they're miserable. When you fall in love with the Lord, you still obey Him, but the motive is because you love Him. Amen. You're willing to do His will. That needs to be the principle. Oh, would God, if the world could understand that, people would want to be Christians. Why should I be confident that my new birth experience will be successful? Let's look at the answer. Philippians 1, 6, He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of the Lord. Now, when I think about what my example is, who's my example as a Christian? Jesus is my example. A Christian is a follower of Christ. And when I look at him, I think, 
I've got a long way to go. And if you allow yourself, you could be discouraged, but you need to remember that he's going to finish what he began. When I look at how far he brought me, I've got confidence that he's the author and the finisher of my faith. He will never quit on you if you don't quit on him. You're free. You can let go of him, but he will never let go of you as long as you're willing to stay in his hands. And that's good news. He will finish what he's begun. So don't get discouraged. The Christian life is progressive. You've got to learn to walk and live a new way. Isaiah chapter 1 says, learn to do good. There's a process involved. Why do some people fail in their Christian experience? Isaiah 53 verse 6 tells us, because we've turned everyone to his own way. Now, being a Christian means following the Lord. The disciples followed him. The way the children of Israel got from Egypt to the promised land, they needed to follow that pillar of cloud. They needed to follow the Lord. As long as they followed, they were safe. And if you're willing to go where God leads you, do not look at the obstacles. So many times the children of Israel got into trouble, and we're no different today, incidentally. They got into trouble because they looked at the circumstances instead of remembering by faith God's power. They'd come up to the Red Sea. And they'd see the Egyptians were coming up from behind with their weapons and the mountains were on both sides. They'd say, oh, we're in trouble. God said, don't worry, just follow me. And he parts the sea. Don't look at how big Goliath is. Look at how big the Lord is. Amen. This is one of the principal lessons in the Bible is all things are possible by faith. How can I know that Jesus accepts me and that I'm his child? Answer, Titus 1, verse 2. God that cannot lie has promised no matter how you try and stretch the truth of God, it does not change. He is consistent. When he makes a promise, you can count on him to keep his word. Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it shall be given you. Ask and you'll receive. Jesus said you receive not because you don't ask. God is a thousand times more willing to give than we are to ask him. How shall true conversion change a life? And there's several things in this answer. First part, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It's a sad fact that the divorce rate among Christians is not much different than that in the world. We've got to learn how to love. That's one of our principal lessons. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he is a, a new creature who wants to live a new life. 1 John 3, verse 22. We keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is the perfect and acceptable and perfect will of God. We are to be new creatures that do new things. I've got a theory. God designed people to be addicted to him. When man rebelled against God, it created a vacuum, a hole in our soul. And man is constantly trying to shove something else in to fill that void. Everybody is a sinaholic. Everybody has an addiction unless you are filled with the Lord. Until you learn to fill that vacuum with God, I can simply say, what's your addiction? Because you've got something. It may be drugs. It may be somebody. Some people are addicted to their, their work and fashion and all shopping. Until we fill that void, we just need to ask ourselves, what's our addiction? We've been designed to be in love with and obsessed with God. And when you have that experience, you're finally happy. What wonderful promises come with the Christian life? Answer is found in Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. God is able to help you do what you think is impossible. All things are possible with God. Without him, you can do nothing. God shall supply all your needs and many of your wants. Amen? Amen? Usually gives us a lot of things that we want too. With God, all things are possible. Don't underestimate what the Lord can do. That your joy may be full. Christians are supposed to be on their way to a feast, and so often we look like we're making our way to a funeral, right? That they might have life and have it more abundantly. He furthermore promises that we're not alone. He says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And then in Hebrews 13, verse 6, he says, I will not fear what man might do unto me. 
We don't have to be afraid anymore. You know, so many people are they're struggling with fear all the time. My peace I give unto you. Have you felt that peace that passes understanding? It's available now, friends. You can have a peace, and it comes from inviting the Prince of Peace into your life. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with this week's special offer. Do we make a day holy, or does God do that? Can you and I bless and sanctify a day? What we're talking about is what does the Bible teach? There's a lot of things that people assume that are not accurate. The devil wants people to work, work, work so that we do not think about eternity. We don't think about what the real purpose of life is. And you owe it to yourself to hear the whole thing out and then deal with the Lord and say, what do you want me to do about this? Thank you for joining us for this broadcast. If you've missed any of our Amazing Facts programs, visit our website at amazingfacts.org. There you'll find an archive of all our television and radio programs, including Amazing Facts Presents, Central Study Hour, Everlasting Gospel, Bible Answers Live, and Wonders in the Word. You'll also find a storehouse of biblical resources geared towards answering some of your most difficult questions. And our online Bible school is just a click away. One location, so many possibilities. Amazingfacts.org. Friends, if there is any subject in God's Word you want to be sure to clearly understand, it's how to be saved. In the Bible, you'll find the amazing story of God's plan of redemption and how even now you can look forward to a place with Him in paradise. It's true. Jesus made a profound sacrifice to provide you with everlasting life. You owe it to yourself to understand what you must do to be saved. We'd like to help you embrace this wonderful offer of life. So we've prepared a special booklet we'd like to send you for free. It's entitled, Assurance, Justification Made Simple. In it, we clearly outline the simple plan of salvation. And it's yours free when you call the toll-free number on your screen. Ask for offer number 727. Or write us at Amazing Facts, offer number 727, P.O. Box 1058, Roseville, California, 95678. Well, that's all the time we have for today's broadcast. Until next time, remember the words of Jesus. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is your opportunity to take advantage of this week's special offer. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. You may also visit our website at amazingfacts.org. Thank you for watching Amazing Facts Presents.